Ah, back out here live once again in aquaponics paradise, bringing you the heat, the flames, and the fire. I'm ready to go right now, ladies and gentlemen. It's overcast out here, getting ready to rain, but I don't give a freak. That has nothing to do with me. We're getting ready to get this lecture off so the information can be brought out there to the people in aquaponics land. Now, what we're gonna be talking about today are the various body parts of a fish with a special concentration on the tilapia fish. The various body parts are important um, to the livelihood of a fish, you know, maneuvering, stability, um, getting around, understanding their environment. All these things are important and the body parts help the fish maneuver and use those um, various body parts to get around and um, live their lives, if you will. So we're gonna to be touching on that, going over that right now. But before we jump into the lecture, I need to take a breath. Woo, let's get into it, ladies and gentlemen. And now, what we're gonna start off with is the mouth. Now, the mouth, when you open up the mouth of a tilapia, what you're gonna notice is little bitty teeth that are in there. These are little conical teeth shaped in, in a conical shape. Um, they feel like sandpaper when you uh, rub your fingers across them. They're, you know, um, they have that type of texture to them. Um, the mouth here is for holding whatever food it has in its mouth, holding it in place. You know, whatever kind of um, munching they can do on the food, that's what it's for. Um, when you have smaller tilapia, you know, and you stick your finger in there, they're going to have a little small, little kind of like a, a bite that kind of tickles little something that's really insignificant you can't really feel anything but as the fish get older and you stick your hand in there especially with like a pound fish a pound and a half fish oh boy you're gonna feel a bite <laughs> you're gonna feel something when you stick your finger in there and it's gonna latch on so they have a little bit of power uh, packed behind that bite so this is the mouth of the fish obviously this is where they eat their food this is where they consume so moving on from the mouth we have what is called the nares. Now the nares or the nostrils, these are the olfactory senses for the fish. There's one located on um, uh, both sides of the fish, but like I said, these are pretty much the olfactory senses and in certain species of fish, these act as an alarm system. There was a German scientist by the name of Carl von Frisch who uh, was experimenting on minnows and what he did was he cut a nerve ending at the base of the tail which left a black mark, and that black marking um, was to identify the fish for later experimentation. And what happened was, when he placed that fish back into the rest of the school of fish of uh, minnows, as soon as he placed it back in there, he noticed that the other fish swam away frantically. They got up out of there. So he said, hold on, wait a minute, what's going on here? Did a few more experiments on it, placing it back in there, and they kept doing the same thing over and over. So what he hypothesized is that you know, there's some type of chemical uh, substance being released by the attacked fish or the injured fish, but in nature it'd be, the, it'd be an attacked fish, letting off some type of chemical substance that these other minnows can detect. So they're detecting some type of attack. Basically, it's mimicking an, an attack. So when they smell this, they say, we got to get up out of here. Like, you know, we, there's a fish being attacked, and we, we recognize that smell. It's time for us to hit the road. So that's what happens. They hit the road every single time. So um, it just shows that, you know, the olfactory sense is very important, particularly in, in like a species like minnow, which they rely on. If somebody is, uh, um, uh, falls behind, become a victim to prey, that's just what it is. The rest of them say, you know, that's just him. We got to get out of here and we got to survive. So that's one part of the olfactory system. Another part, um, uh, another use of the olfactory system or the nares is in, a, um, in the species carp. They can smell the mucus that's secreted from the skin. There's a mucus and you can feel it, the mucus on the, um, on like a, on, on the tilapia and other uh, uh, species as well, a slimy coating. Carp can smell that. So they did an experiment, another experiment was done where they created a wooden carp and they placed it in a tank full of uh, living carp just to see like the kind of behavior habits that the carp would display with that wooden carp placed in the tank. And when they place the wooden carp in there, they realize nothing's happening. So what they said is, let's take the wooden carp out 
and let's coat it with the mucus from the carp. So they coated it up, then they placed it back in there, and bam, what happened? The other carp surrounding, they begin following the wooden carp. They said, hold on, we recognize that smell. That guy's one of us. Start giving them pounds and everything. Like, what's up, man? We recognize you. You're one of us. Follow them around and everything. The olfactory sense, these things are, are, are amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now you have in the species tilapia. They did experimentation on tilapia. And what happens is in the pre-ovulatory uh, uh, um, phase of the fish, just before the, the female fish begins to release eggs, um, she be, uh, begins to excrete pheromones through the, um, the urine and through the feces. And the males, they begin, to, when they smell it, they have physiological changes that occur, which causes them to become more aggressive and more territorial. And they begin to be behaving um, uh, in different manners, start courting. It causes a, a physiological change uh, within the males. So they smell that. They rely on identifying um, uh, 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 mating partners through the olfactory senses. So it's very, very important. These things are very, very important in a variety of species of fish. They use them for uh, different things, but nonetheless, they're all important. And they do amazing things with these things. Absolutely amazing, ladies and gentlemen. Now, from here, we can move on to uh, what is called the operculum. Now, the operculum, or some may call it or reference it as um, the gill cover, it's like a hard, bony structure located on like the side of the, um, the face of the fish. It's covering the gills and protecting the gills. So you can feel it. When you tap on it, it's a hard, bony structure there. Now, it's covering the gills. Now, the gills are extremely important. We know this already. The gills are made up of uh, soft tissues or filaments. And um, in the gills, that's where um, there's a transport of ions and water. Also, that's where you have gas exchange that's occurred. You have oxygen coming in, carbon dioxide coming out. Also, we know that the, most, uh, the majority of the ammonia is excreted through the gills as well. The gaseous version of ammonia excreted out. It contacts the water, depending on the pH um, and the water temperature. Some of that gaseous ammonia uh, gets converted into an ionic form of ammonium which plants can also use, but that's not what we're gonna be talking about right now. But just know that, you know, gas is exchanged through the gills and um, 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 the operculum is what's protecting this um, very important soft tissue structure known as the gills. So from here, we can move on to the eyes. Now, fish are what are known as myopic, meaning that they're nearsighted. They don't really see at long distances and that's due to the shape of their eye. They have a round shaped eye that's causing that nearsightedness. And they probably don't need to see at long distance. It's unnecessary because they rely on other sensory factors um, for things like spatial awareness, environmental recognition, species recognition, prey and predator recognition, things, you know, senses such as the um, olfactory senses and their lateral line, which we will be talking about in this video. They don't re really rely on their sight for that. What they do rely on their sight for is coming up to the tail end of the attack, boom, boom. Just before they're getting ready to lay the yomp down, that's when they can really see the, um, the, uh, the, the prey. They're using their other senses to locate the prey, and then when they're coming up close, boom, they see you, yomp. I need that. You're mine. I got you. That's when they use the, um, their vision. Very important uh, factor when they're using their vision is up close up close and personal combat. Now, another thing that they use their vision for is for recognizing mating, pa uh, mating partners, recognizing uh, the dominant and the subordinate fish, um, also uh, recognizing enemies, like I kind of mentioned. These are very important things. They ran an experiment where they placed two fish in a tank and they let them kind of duel it out, you know, mouth to mouth, dueling it out. The dominant fish, they left in the tank, the subordinate fish, they removed him out of the tank. A few days later, the researchers came back, they placed that subordinate fish in there, they, they, used, they experimented on two different fish. The subordinate fish that had already met with the, the dominant fish that was remaining in the tank, and they used another fish, another subordinate fish that they had uh, fighting it out with another fish in an, uh, a separate tank. This was a, a, a fish species that had lost in a separate tank. So they placed both of these fish at different times 
in the tank with the um with the dominant fish in the control tank the fish that had already been in here and had a history with the dominant fish in this control tank they realized and they um they recognized that there was less aggression in this tank less aggression he had already had a history and he can recognize me i recognized him before he's the one who laid them laid laid them them hands on me before i can recognize you I recognize that butt whooping that you put on me. But the other fish from the different tank who had never had a history with this fish, when they put him in there, you know, he's like, you know, I think I got a shot. Even though I got my behind tore up in that other tank, in this tank, looking at you, I feel like I got a shot. And then, you know, it'd be more aggression. So they can recognize it. They can see, um, they can recognize the fish that's a dominant species and uh, fish that they've had history uh, with before in the past. Very, very important. These guys are living in their own world, ladies and gentlemen. You have to understand that. This stuff is amazing. They're in their own world underneath this water. Their own type of structures going on, old type of, own type of civilizations going on. Own world. It's some amazing things. These are the eyes, ladies and gentlemen. Now, moving on from the eyes, we can move on to the, uh, the, the pectoral and the pelvic fins. Now, these are what are known as paired fins. There's more than one of them. The pelvic fin has a pair, and the uh, pectoral fin has a pair. And pretty much the main function of these paired fins is for stabilization and maneuvering. What they can do is they can extend these things out, extend the pelvic fins out, extend the, uh, the pectoral fins out, and that can help stop in motion, stop the fish in motion. It's almost like a brake, a braking system. Amazing stuff. Um, the, pe uh, the pectoral fin also can be extended out um, and uh, positioned almost like the bow planes on a submarine. How the bow planes on a submarine can be tilted in certain angles, which allows it to climb or descend. The pelvic fins are used in the same fashion. It's amazing how a lot of the technology that you'll see um, humans have made resemble what you find in nature because a lot of observation has occurred, which allow, which has given humans the idea to make a lot of these things. Submarine, a lot of that is mimicking what you find in an environment, in an aquatic environment. And that only makes sense. If you want to travel in the water, it only makes sense for you to try to mimic something that has already developed, or created or evolved, however you see it, for that particular environment. And that's exactly what we do. Also, the pectoral fins, they can be extended out and uh, maneuvered to help the fish maneuver uh, from left to right, just like um, the oar, using the oars on a, a rowboat. It's the same thing. We've been doing this since prehistoric times. Observing nature, then, you know, mimicking it, finding out how we can, you know, uh, uh, duplicate it and use it to our advantage. Now, a lot of people are using the technology for a lot of wicked things like war and stuff like that. But, you know, nonetheless, that's what they're, um, that's what they're doing. So, you know, th these guys already have vehicles, you know, these living organisms, these aquatic organisms and many other organisms already have vehicles suited for that environment. So we go in there and we just duplicate it and try to mimic it to the best of our ability. So that's what's going on. So this is pretty much what's happening with the pectoral and the pelvic fin. Uh, another thing with the pelvic fin or the, the pectoral fin is, you know, that's the main maneuvering mechanism when it comes to the fish. That's pretty much what they're gonna be using the majority of the time to maneuver around, you know, light swimming. Um, but the pelvic fin, it does assist in swimming and, and maneuvering, but it's mainly a, a, a stabilizer. It helps keep the fish from uh, moving and tipping over on its side. You know, it, it just keeps the, the fish stabilized. It helps in that aspect of it. So that is pretty much these paired fins, the pectoral and the um, pelvic fins from here. We can talk about the dorsal and the anal fin. Now, we know that the dorsal and the anal fin, these are also stabilizers as well. They help keep the fish pretty much balanced and keep it from, you know, tipping over. They're almost like uh, the keels on a, a, a sailboat, which, you know, counteract the, the, um, the, the wind force that's coming in on, on the sailboat. It keeps it from swing that's what those keels do you got a heavy keel underneath the bottom of uh, of the sailboat it's the same thing they're taking the same exact things and just uh mimicking it 
finding it in nature and then finding how we can, you know, duplicate it and mimic it and use it, you know, uh, towards our advantage. So that's what the dorsal fins and the, um, and the anal fin does. And those are pretty much very important when the fish is kind of moving at a slow, steady pace. As it starts to pick up speed, boom, it's not really necessary, the dorsal and the anal fins. They don't, they're not really as important, right? So these are stabilizers as well. Helps keep the fish balanced. Now from here, what we can talk about um, is the spines. Let's talk about the spines on the fins. Now fish, they're divided into two categories depending on the characteristics of their um, fins. You have what is known as soft rayed fish which are fish that have no spines located on their fins. And these are fish like trout and cod. Um, you also have what is known as spiny rayed fish. And these are fish that have spines in at least one of their fins. And these are fish like tilapia, um, catfish, barramundi. These are gonna be uh, under the category of spiny rayed fish. Now tilapia, they have spines in the dorsal fins. They have spines in the anal fins. They have spines in the uh, pelvic fins. They have all those uh, spines in there. Now, what you need to understand is that these spines are there for a reason. They're not there just for show and tell. They're there for a reason. They use these things as, as a defense mechanism. Tilapia, tilapia, what they do is when they get excited or uh, uh, afraid, they thrust these things out with an intent, an extreme intent behind it of poking something. And if you mishandle it or if you grab the wrong size tilapia and it thrusts that thing out, because believe me, it's thrusting it with an intention to do some damage. And if it hits you, you're going to have some blood that's coming out. Believe me, you're going to have some blood that's coming out. See, I know how to deal with these guys. I know what size to grab from them. A little small 30 gram tilapia. Get your behind over here. I'll grab him full hand and everything. He'll be trying to uh, thrust his spines out. No problemo. It doesn't really hurt because the spines aren't developed. The larger the fish, the larger the tilapia, the bigger the spine. So a small fish gets you behind over here. I'll grab them. But a larger fish, we're talking about half a pound, three quarters of a pound, and, and you know, and larger, I gotta respect them. See, I gotta put gloves on for him because I know what type of, what type of damage he's trying to inflict. He doesn't, he doesn't want to be grabbed out of the water. He's not feeling that. He doesn't understand what's happening. For examination and stuff like that, he doesn't want, he doesn't want none of that happening. So he's trying to defend himself and it makes sense. So you got to be careful when you're dealing with uh, tilapia or dealing with any type of spiny rayed fish because it will inflict some damage. Now, there's some fish out there that have poison in their spines, fish like lionfish. Oh, if you grab hold of one of those, you just know you get ready to pay the price. So you shouldn't be dealing with something like that. Understand what type of fish you're grabbing on before you go and try to grab it. Be very, very careful. Leave a, leave a lionfish, leave that to guys who have uh, um, professional training in that area. Because you will get the, that will occur. You know what that means. I don't even have to say nothing. That, mm-hmm, you know what's happening. So be careful. Now, another defense, uh, defensive way that fish use the, um, the, uh, the spines is, you know, like for instance, tilapia when they lock the dorsal fins or the anal fins and the, uh, the pelvic fins in place, they stiffen them out, boom, lock them out. What they do is they use that to try to appear larger than what they are. It's like, like an illusionary tactic. They become magicians trying to make themselves appear bigger because there's a law of the land. You know, the bigger you, are, the bigger you are or the bigger you can appear, the less enemies you have to deal with, the less likely that, you know, that predator is going to try to, you know, a, a, attempt that attack. So when a tilapia sees a predator, boom, flares up, that predator is going to be looking like, you know, you, you might be a little, if, if, he, if you were lunch size before you flared up and then you flared up, he might like it look at you and be like, you know what, you might be about, you might be about an inch and a half, a little bit too big. About an inch and a half, I'm going to leave you alone. You see that? So that's a defense mechanism also that they use for, um, uh, the spines are used for very very unique things man I'm telling you this stuff is amazing man these underworlds these uh, the different worlds other than the, we think that we only got the only world that's going on the human world all these other worlds these animal worlds these things are amazing man absolutely phenomenal phenomenal stuff 
So with that being said, we talked about the spines and the fins. Um, we can move on from here and we could talk about the lateral line. Now the lateral line, this is like the fish's sonar or a radar um, device. Amazing stuff. This allows the fish to detect different vibrations um, in, the, um, in the water. Now the lateral line, before we get into it, it on the tilapia, it extends just uh, behind the operculum, moving along the, um, the moving horizontally along the body of the tilapia, just so you get to pretty much the base of the, um, the tail. Right there, that, that area right there. This is the lateral line. It almost looks like stitches. Like someone came in there and did some um, a surgical work and placed some stitches on there. Now, like I said, they can detect vibrations in the water using this thing. Detect fish movement, spatial surroundings, understanding where something is located at. And this is very important, especially um, in turbid water or, you know, or opaque or in cloudy water where you can't really uh, use a lot of uh, the, the visual senses. Very, very important. Allows them to recognize um, uh, the, the vibrational uh, frequency of their same species. They can kind of recognize um, the, um, their species, fellow species off of them, depending on the, um, the fish species that we're dealing with. Very, very important stuff. I read an article um, where submarines and sonar, all this technology is based off of the lateral line of a fish. They're trying to perfect sonar by studying the lateral line, trying to improve the sonar technology. They're not there yet, but they're trying to being able to um, identify uh, the environment and, and, you know, down there within the waters, trying to get a better sense of what's going on down there using, you know, um, mimicking the technology from the fish's lateral line. Crazy, crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Now, prey or the predators, they use their lateral lines to locate the, the location of the prey. So as you know, they're, they're trying to hone, home in on where that prey is located at, and um, then they go ahead and, and go in for the attack. Now, what happens is, uh, like a singular fish, it's going to have its own frequency, its own vibrational frequency within the water. It's going to let it off. A school of fish, what they have developed, is since they own, since they each have their own individual vibrational frequency, they get together in a school, and those singular vibrational frequencies begin to overlap. So what that does is that throws off the predator, trying to come in. He can't really focus on, you know, one singular fish. It's throwing him off. He can't really focus on where it's at. So they use this as, you know, as a defense. Fire. Fire. Absolutely fire. This is the lateral line, ladies and gentlemen. The lateral line. Understand this. Very, very important. Now, from here, what we can touch on is the caudal fin. Now, the caudal fin, this is pretty much the propulsion mechanism for the fish. The booster. The rocket launcher. The thing that makes it go fume. It's the speed. It's the thing that pushes it and propels it through the water. You know, when fish are kind of at a, you know, at their lazy moments or kind of just lagging around, they're using their pectoral fins, just kind of floating around, you know, the water. They're mainly using the pectoral fins. But when that shark jaws comes around, boom, they're out of there. That's when they hit the boosters on the, um, the, the caudal fin because it has a bony structure um, in the caudal fin that gives it strength and allows it to kind of, boom, shoot through the... Um, shoot through the water and maneuver. So it hits it up, it's like a speed burster, boom. It gets it through the water and it hits it at high speeds. Depending on the, the, the fish species, these guys can get up to some extremely high speeds, burst speeds with that caudal fin. Swordfish, we're talking about 60 miles an hour, cutting up all in the ocean. Cutting all up in the ocean. Dolphins, we're talking about 37 miles per hour. Salmon, we're talking about upwards of 14 miles per hour, getting where they got to go using that, um, that caudal fin. Like I said, it's similar to um, the, the propeller on a ship. That's what propels the ship forward. Like I said, all this tech, a lot of this technology is based off just observing what we see in, uh, in, in already living uh, organisms. That vehicle that they have, that they developed or created, however you look at it, 
over you know a, a certain dispensation of time. That's just what it is. So that's the caudal fin, ladies and gentlemen. Now from here, what we can talk about is the sexual differentiation between tilapia. Now, tilapia, it's, it's, pretty, it's really not that hard to differentiate a male tilapia and a female tilapia. When you turn the, the fish over, we we'll start with the male. You turn a male tilapia over, and these really, it takes pretty much a little bit of time for um, sexual maturity to, to occur. We're talking about anywhere from three to six months where you'll really be able to look and observe and it will be more pronounced. But say you have a sexually mature tilapia where you're able to look at it and uh, the, the sexual organs are more pronounced, you flip it over, you can look at it, and um, what you'll see is the male tilapia will have what is known as a genital papilla. And that's that little nipple-like thing uh, on the underside of it. And uh, what else it will have with it is basically a hole at the tip of that um, genital papilla. And that's pretty much the extent of what is um, the identifying factor of a male. That's all it has. Now, you take a female, a uh, sexually mature female, flip it over, you'll see that it also has a genital papilla uh, as well. And also, it's going to have a hole there, what is known as a urinary uh, pore. It's going to have that there. But what else it's going to have is what is known as an oviduct. That is that little slit, runs horizontal on the genital papilla. That's where the eggs are going to be released from. That is the factor right there that you're going to be looking for when you're trying to identify a female tilapia. That little slit right there, similar to the human anatomy, males have just a, you know, a protruding figure, females are going to have a slit. Same concept. You flip it over, you can see it. You can use dye there to help identify it, some type of food coloring to help identify it. And that's pretty much what's going to let you know the difference, uh, one of the, the factors to let you know the difference between a male and a female, right? So this right here, ladies and gentlemen, is the breakdown of the body parts of a fish, the external anatomy with a special concentration on tilapia. Hopefully we've learned something, ladies and gentlemen. We should always be learning something. Learning is a forever process, an ongoing process. We're trying to learn whatever we need to learn, and hopefully you've learned something today. So with that being said, this is Brooklyn St. Michael with the School of Aquaponics reminding you to stop walking and get you a car.